I'm Omri and I'm the program manager for the 5G studio and part of the new lab team. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, many of you are already familiar with our work at new lab. Others may be encountering our work for the first time today. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with new lab, uh, we are a community of experts, innovators applying transform transformative technology to solve the world's biggest challenges. Through our memberships and studios, uh, we bring together entrepreneurs, engineers, um, innovators, investors, and industry leaders to create sustainable solutions for our enterprises. Uh, we employ technologies, including robotics, AI, material science, to transform what matters most, health, environment, media, cities, and infrastructure. Um, that mission, of course, is taking a whole new meaning during this pandemic. Um, we are very grateful for you guys to join us today. Um, and we'll cover um, on today's discussion the opportunity and impact of 5G on the, in, on the energy sector. And we'll hear from several industry experts with different backgrounds. Uh, a few housekeeping notes before we hand it over to Satish, uh, New Lab's Chief Product Officer, who will be moderating the discussion today. Our panelists are very much looking for uh, questions from the audience. So feel free to submit any questions through the Q&A button and I will make sure to help to get those in front of our panelists. And now, without further ado, I would like to pass it to Satish um, to begin the discussion. Thank you, Amri, and, and, and thank you all for attending this webinar, and, and I'll be thanking the panelists as well, I'm sure, throughout. Um, just, a, just a quick uh, sort of who we are at New Lab. We do two things uh, at New Lab. We help early stage technology companies grow, and we work with industry and government leaders to help them solve their challenges. And, and oftentimes delivering um, a new way of thinking and, and opportunities that allow them to grow in the industries that they're oftentimes leading. Um, we do this in a variety of ways um, between, commu between community, our investment strategy, and most importantly with our innovation studios. And our innovation studios are programs and platforms that work with industry and government partners to solve their challenges by recruiting in companies um, that are in the early stage developing technologies that really can transform the way a business works, the way we look at a certain problem, um, the where we address a certain operational challenge and really deliver growth in a variety of ways. These studios focus on product. And so oftentimes we're engaging our industry partners and in generating those insights. What is it that you see as a headwind? What do you, is it that you see as an opportunity? And turning that towards the outside world and recruiting companies that we think have technologies that, and products that can answer those challenges. And we put them through a product development process through our studio and ultimately get to, uh, try to get our companies into testing and pilot environments with our industry and government partners. And it's this type of validation that we really find important, especially when you're talking about frontier technologies and you're talking about the complex operational and industry challenges that our panelists represent here today. And so these studios, I think, have demonstrated over the past few years an ability to really surface what matters when it comes to tech and how to apply it best um, within an approach that an industry is oftentimes um, trying to lead. One of our premier programs is with our partners in Verizon and new business incubation team in the 5G studio. And in this program, we focus again on finding frontier technology solutions in the startup world that can come to New Lab and test their solutions and the 5G implementations of the solutions at a private 5G network and mobile edge compute stack installed and managed by Verizon, our partners here at New Lab. And so this is an amazing opportunity for frontier technologists to really find a ways and understand and explore how 5G can really transform what they're doing today. How do, you, how do you connect more devices? How do you take advantage of low latencies and high speeds? How do you, how do you create this entire system of orchestration um, within environments such as industry, industrial automation or manufacturing? And so it's been an exciting uh, year and a half of working together with the Verizon team, some of which you'll hear about today. Um, and we focus on a few uh, key areas, industrial automation, transportation, and what the topic of today will be is around energy. First, I'd like to turn to our partner, um, Elise Neal, who's the VP of, of the new business incubation team, our partners for the 5G studio, to share a bit more on their view on 5G and how it's impacting these industries. Hi, thanks for having me. And um, hi, friends from the New Lab community. We're excited to be back talking about our favorite topic, which is 5G. Maybe for those of you who have really uh, struggled to get outside and read the news during the pandemic, it turns out 5G is uh, really big and it's, and it's here. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of background of why you should be excited about 5G and, and the differences. And the easiest way to think about it is when you think about the generations of connectivity that have come before 1, 2, 3, and 4G, each of those functions of generations added really two components. It added speed and throughput only. So that meant that you got faster speeds and fatter pipes. 
5G is something altogether new. It is an entirely new spectrum orientation that not only offers increased speed and really, really fat pipes, it also has the benefit of six additional currencies to make up eight unique characteristics of the 5G spectrum. As we turn to the next slide, you can see what some of these benefits are as we kind of divide them into this pied slice. And you can begin to kind of imagine a world where today in a 4G network, you can connect a thousand devices per square mile. That begins to be expanded significantly as we think about connecting millions of devices per square mile in a 5G world. When we think about aspects of mobility and struggles that we have today in our connectivity landscape of maintaining a sticky connection at high speeds, we now see new opportunities in mobility at over 500 kilometers per hour. That's like 350 miles per hour, that's wicked fast. So when you think about transforming industries like air and train and Formula One, all of a sudden we have opportunities to think about data transmission in a new way and new degrees of scale as we think about uh, opportunities to kind of onboard and offboard different areas of compute and where they sit inside the network. One of the things that we're really excited to talk about today is energy efficiency and how that energy efficiency kind of plays into the Verizon application and our network deployments as well, which we'll come back to. But each of these currencies provide a unique opportunity for us to lean into innovation and to think about the world that will be um, and the world that is right now as we continue to deploy the nation's largest 5G network. As we think about kind of what do I do and what is my team responsible for in new business incubation, we're responsible for building new software businesses that will leverage this 5G future. Today, we have investments in aerial robotics, terrestrial robotics, location intelligence, digital space management, energy transformation, adaptive manufacturing, and many, many others. As we think about all of these disruptions that will come to be, and our partnership with New Lab is one of the ways that we think about engaging in the community holistically, both with other corporate partners, as well as the innovators of today and tomorrow. And so as we kind of bridge into um, the topic for today, I couldn't talk about energy without talking about Verizon's commitment to sustainability. One of the greatest things that I love about being a part of the Verizon family is we don't just believe in sustainability, but we put our money and our actions where our mouth is. And so while I won't go through each of these components here, one of the things I'm most proud about in terms of our sustainability efforts is not only do we have a significant commitment to go to net zero emissions by 2035, we're not just removing um, energy consumption, we're also committed to adding back clean energy into the grid. We're gonna talk about this exchange and this value exchange of this energy ecosystem today, but uh, Verizon is excited to participate. Thanks to Teach for having us and I'll turn it back to you. Awesome, great. Thanks for that intro, Elise. And so I'd like to, I'd like to ask the panelists to turn on their cameras and join us. Great, and so I'd just like to, I'd like to start with a, just a quick 30 seconds from each of you to kind of introduce yourselves. So the first on my screen is Kristen Barbado from Build Edison. Thanks so much for having me today. It's been so great to uh, learn more about what you're doing at New Lab and as well with Verizon and so much that they have in store as well. So um, just by way of brief introduction, I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Build Edison. Our whole purpose is to help clean energy solutions, clean tech solutions get to commercial commercialization faster. And so we do that through several different methods of understanding market, market development, product development, as well as business development activities. And we work across areas that involve many things that we're gonna be talking about today, such as smart grid, um, EV charging, charging infrastructure, anything extra grid, building vehicles to grid, building to grid, renewables, storage. So that's the area that we work within and um, just really excited to be here today. Thanks so much. Great, great having you, Kristen. Uh, next, Brooke Nodal from Orsted. Great, uh, yeah. Thank you for having me, Satish. Uh, I am actually the director of engineering for Orsted's offshore business in North America. Um, Orsted is a world leader in the offshore wind industry. I think we have something like 35% of the market share uh, at the moment. Uh, and yeah, I'm really excited about this technology and and, and what it can do. I, I've seen a, an incredible transition in just energy in our country across the world from uh, the whole uh, fossil fuel generation that, that existed forever to this uh, really fast adoption of renewables and, and how we're going to integrate that. I think 5G is going to play a critical role in how we make this successful transition. Great. Yeah, we'll definitely dig into that more. Um, and Aaron Fisher from EV Passport. Yeah, uh, I'm Aaron Fisher from EV Passport. Thank you for having me today. 
Uh, EV Passport is a hardware and software electric vehicle charging platform focused on purpose-driven organizations. And we believe in a connected intelligent charging systems with open data, which is exactly geared toward uh, this conversation today around uh, connectivity and energy management. Great. All right. So, so thank you. This is an incredible panel. And also I'm happy to call all each of you partners of new labs. So it's been exciting to work with you. We're in different stages of our relationships, but it's really, it's really great to be, to get to know all of you. And so, and so thank you upfront for, for participating in the panelists in the program. Um, at least we always like to start with you because I think Verizon, especially the new business incubation team um, is increasingly just has this great sort of view of the sector, especially from your perspective and connectivity. And so let's talk about energy and let's, let's let you set, set the stage first and what your observations are in terms of the headwinds of the energy sector and how that's being answered, you said you think today with, with connectivity and 5G. And I'm sure we'll get a lot of content out that way for the rest of the panelists. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I really think that um, as we think about 5G application into the energy ecosystem, it really is that. It is what is the ecosystem of energy, particularly around distributed energy, and how do we break that down into individual responsibilities and opportunity areas? There are kind of three places that I would kind of turn our attention to that I know we're going to talk about today. The first is the grid itself. So how do we create kind of localization kind of onto the grid? How do we match energy and resources in a hyper local manner so that we can understand kind of supply and demand in a more accurate and adequate manner? In addition to that, we see the grid connection through virtual power points and the or power plants, excuse me, and the ability to think about different opportunities to kind of attach distributed energy resources into the grid to become their own kind of self-sustaining uh, opportunity. The second area is just the distribution of energy. So you have the grid and then you've got kind of this energy distribution, right? And so when we think about there's the, the opportunity of moving generation kind of closer to the point of consumption, we see and have partners here today that are talking about ways to do that seamlessly. How do we create fewer long transmission lines so that our opportunity to get closer to the consumer, closer to the customer and closer to both generation and consumption all there at the same time. And then the third piece is really the ecosystem as a whole. How do we get more granular visibility of data, both in front of and behind the meter? How do we think about more accurate monitoring? How do we think about this combination of real time and localization to ultimately enable better efficiency, better forecasting and better management? Um, we see connectivity as a play all the way throughout, as well as a wide variety of hardware and software solutions all coming together to create a more sustainable and, and frankly, a more hardened kind of energy ecosystem than what we have today. Nice, yeah, and, and so Brooke, I'm gonna to turn to you because being one of those, you know, at least talks about ecosystem and we, we have an ecosystem represented here on the panel. And so from you coming from the renewable energy perspective, I'm sure, you know, obviously transmissions is, is, is part of the things you have to think about. How are you viewing connectivity today, you, you know, in terms of from fossil fuel, sort of a rigid kind of supply chain and distribution of energy, what are you thinking about today from Orsted's view? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things I think I'm most excited about is is really the, the, the very low latency that 5G offers, and it's probably going to give us our first opportunity to really truly realize smart grid. And, and historically, we've always matched generation to load, but I think there's a great opportunity here as we evolve this to actually match the load to the generation as and, and be a much more efficient about how we're generating energy and using energy. So I'm pretty excited about that aspect of it. What are, what, are, what are some challenges that Orsted has to think about when to be more, I guess that means that Orsted's uh, renewable energy source is more of a dynamic kind of contributor to this type of smart grid. So what do you what do you think about when you're thinking about where Orsted needs to be in terms of connectivity? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I, I'm thinking more in a sense of the grid itself. I think that, you know, we really need to think more strategically about how we operate and control the grid. And I think, you know, Orsted's mission is really to create a world that runs entirely on green energy. And we can't do that alone as a generator. It has to be a much broader approach to how we incorporate this technology and use it. So, um, you know, we, we, we're, we're pretty good at understanding what we do, but we understand that uh, the other aspects of it all need to play a role together uh, to, to make it successful. Yeah, that transition. I, I think we're seeing that as well. And, and Kristen, I know you've got, you, you've, you have a portfolio of clients that cut across this ecosystem as well. Um, do you see some common themes when it comes to connectivity and smart grid or, or, or how, how are they, what are they, what are they thinking when it comes to, comes to that? Absolutely. What are the challenges, what are some of the technologies they're looking at? Yeah, and so we work much, much more on the distribution side and one of the commonalities, that's one of the areas of commonality. And what you're really seeing there is grid edge and how solutions from the, that are meeting the utility and the grid itself 
are having such such a greater impact. When I think of, when I go back and I think of how many different ways we would define smart grid, there was one um, conceptual way of defining it that se seemed to make sense, make sense for me and how it resonated. And it was how we have many different nodes of either sources or sinks for energy, so consumption or production. And it's not just unidirectional now anymore from large plant to many, many different sources. So when you think about all those different nodes, you're thinking about what's the connectivity, not just from the wires to transport the electrons, but also communications. So you're balancing appropriately. And I'd say that one of the threads that we have across some of the clients that we work with is understanding the applications and operations for those technologies to work under in order to transmit not only electrons, understand and communicate what's happening with them too for those different types of operating environments. Yeah. And, and Aaron, I want you, I, I'd love to hear from you too on, on this part as well. Uh, there, we'll get more specifics in EV charging, but you do represent the other endpoint, uh, so to speak, with your products. And so when you, when you think about connecting to utilities and grids and seeing this kind of transformation towards a smart grid environment, how do, how do you think about what do you need to address when you're building your products, especially with connectivity? Well, right now, uh, fundamentally, 4G was not built for, for smart cities or smart grids. So something that becomes an increasing concern for me, especially with electric vehicle charging systems, is latency and reliability, uh, especially when you consider installing you know, 10, 20, 30 of these things in a single parking lot. And there's not really uh, prioritization of data in a way that 5G allows. And so with 5G enabling you know, improved latency and end-to-end and, and, uh, reliability, it, it really is about being able to speed up the decisions that are made on any type of intelligent EV charging system. Uh, if you can make decisions, especially around fleets, on which chargers are outputting a certain amount of energy at any given time, uh, you can fundamentally create a better network, a better charging experience, a better grid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and at least I, I, I'm going to double click on, reli on reliability in a second. But in terms of when someone says to you latency and kind of mm -hmm. that's clearly a, a clear value prop, but what else do you think about in terms of the 5G currencies based on what you've heard from Ute, Kristen, and Brooke and Aaron so far? Yeah, I think from, um, from a latency perspective, it's pretty exciting. So what we're looking at in terms of 5G to put context around like what does ultra low latency mean? We're talking tens of milliseconds, if actually closer to five milliseconds or lower of latency. That's like over a thousand times faster than a blink of an eye. So really what we're talking about is um, the realest of the real time that you can get with massive data transparency that Aaron just talked about. I love the way that Kristen kind of brought in, it's this symbiotic relationship between sources and sinks and really building kind of this ecosystem. So latency, we talked, uh, you heard reliability in there. So four to five nines for reliability at all times. There's ultra security kind of built into this spectrum in and of itself, which completely changes the game when you think about secure connections for something as sensitive as our energy transformation. You obviously have wide, wide amounts of connected devices and others. And I think when we, um, you know, maybe teeing off of Aaron's comment around EVs, they present a really big problem for the grid today, but are also a really meaning part of the solution. And so that intersection is where, you know, we're spending a lot of our time thinking about how do we most intelligently leverage these roaming batteries to provide kind of offsets for you know, energy opportunity as they kind of connect to the grid. Um, the problem to be solved is how do we charge them? Where do we charge them and why and how much? And that kind of load balancing component um, is a really significant you know, challenge that we, that we see and that we face today and that we believe that 5G along with our partners can help, you know, can, uh, can help solve and solution for. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, like that, I like that idea. I, I think what I'm hearing from you and Aaron too is, is, is the number of decisions that need to be made in the smart groups. Mm -hmm is going up exponentially as well. And so, so Kristen, I'm gonna to toss this to you. This is a little bit unscripted a little bit, but I, I, but I think you'll probably have a good answer here. Is, is where are these, who are, who's taking on the kind of the brunt, the bear of, of all these decisions that have to be made? Is it wow. you now have to take on these, these decisions? Is it people like Aaron building EV structure? Is it, is it the fleets? Who, who's, who's owning these decisions now? Yeah, the there's many levels now. So it's not just one where it used to be the utility operator and the grid operator doing that job. Now that we have so many, so many connected devices happening behind the meter with customers, we've got many different opportunities for all of that connectivity to be managed for that type of load and operation. You also have much more that's happening from um, DERMS, if you've heard of the term DERMS, Distributed Energy Resource Management Systems. 
And those types of systems are, are uh, of uh, critical need in order to understand how many of these resources are connecting with utility grids so utilities can then manage their systems appropriately. So the interconnectedness there. So we're seeing a proliferation of many, many different types of logistics happening on the grid in order to manage not just the electrons and the communications we said. And I actually appreciate very much, Elise, you going through those eight currencies for me, because for me, I, I can't speak to, with any kind of expertise, 5G and how it works, but I can speak to what some of the functions are that we need within the grid for distributed resources, for people to have building to grid operations and what that means. So I think that this is really one of those forums that we're pulling together different perspectives on understanding, well, here's what this tool does and here's how, what we need. So um, hopefully that's a little bit helpful to, to address the, uh, the questions, Satish. No, totally, yeah. And, and, and Brooke, I don't know if from the energy source, energy uh, creator side, you know, what, what, how do you see your decision-making changing compared to let's say the traditional oil and gas industry? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the challenges that we'll get into is, is just how rapidly our equipment now works in the renewable sector. And uh, these inverter-based technologies are almost instantaneous. So using these former uh, ways of controlling the system uh, have to change because they're just, uh, we're used to a, a much slower uh, system response to what we're going to get. So we're very concerned about that. We've got our eyes on that and we, we need to uh, plan accordingly. I think this technology offers us the ability to, to really make strides that weren't available when everything was going through multiple layers of servers and, and everything. I think we've got a great opportunity here yeah. to find a solution. Yeah, and I think that's infrastructure is something we'll definitely touch on. I think I think uh, when we talked about 5G reliability, uh, resiliency comes up as well. And of course, we've, we've seen in the news some you know, we have 100 year old grids in the US that, that sort of are suffering from certain climate sort of activity and it knocks out an entire region of power. So distributed energy would certainly help with that. But where does connectivity come into play? What the stakes are higher now, right, in terms of resiliency. So at least I'll go back to you, you know, tell, tell us more about how 5G kind of will power that, that aspect of, of infrastructure. Yeah, I think if you start with like, what do we know to be true? We know that we need uh, there, there will be more electrification. That's just, a, that's just a fact, right? We're getting more electric. We know there will be more renewables. We know that renewables are also intermittent, right? They're not constant. If the sun don't shine and the wind don't blow, like we might have a problem on our hands. And so ultimately when you think about these, these truths that exist, we then have an opportunity to say, okay, how do we create a highly dynamic, flexible infrastructure that allows us to live and breathe and moderate ourselves from an energy perspective along the way? And I think the themes that I kind of keep pulling out here are um, massive interoperability. These things have to work together. When you talk about upstream and downstream suppliers, both hardware, software, and um, the electrons themselves, they all need to interoperate. After you get them kind of connected, th that's not enough. You also have to have massive data transparency that kind of flows throughout. Um, and so when you think about large volumes of data that need to flow at wicked fast speeds, right? And an ultra reliable kind of communication framework, all of these components start coming together where you're checking a lot of boxes going, all right, there's a viable solution. There's a number of partners kind of playing. We really have an opportunity to dynamically change and, and graduate our current grid into one that's smarter. Um, and so we see 5G playing aspects in every single part of that value chain. Um, but again, we can't do it alone, which is why which is why we work so closely with New Lab and with the partners that we have here on the call saying, how can we collectively come across and build this ecosystem? It's really gonna take a village and, uh, and we're excited. I think we got a lot of good people at the table. Yeah, totally, I agree with that. And, and, and Aaron, Aaron, I think you're, you're an example of one of the teams we're looking at working with in the 5G studio. And, and it, when you think about, you know, you're developing, you're developing products that are definitely serving the future state of this electrified world. Are you, are you, are you making, are you relying on the 5G reliability? Is it an opportunity for you? How do you, how do you think about that when you think about resiliency and reliability of the of power? So it, it's an opportunity. So right now, you know, we are not using 5G for EV chargers. There really aren't any 5G electric vehicle chargers uh, out in the world. But when you start deploying massive quantities of intelligent EV chargers uh, that are connected and use proper load balancing, uh, you do run into latency issues. Ru you run into potential reliability issues when they're operating on LTE. If you install 20 chargers in a parking lot and then you, you know, throw another 40 people on top of that, and then they're connected vehicles that are also operating on LTE, you end up with 
you know, latency that can just go up and up and up. And so in those types of installations of electric vehicle charging infrastructure, you will increasingly right now see uh, ethernet and fiber installations. You won't see a reliability on LT or even LTM uh, networks. And so 5G, you know, it's a moment to actually say, we are going to deploy EV chargers and we're gonna do it at scale. We're not gonna just put two in a parking lot. We're gonna put 50 in a parking lot and it's gonna cost less and it's not gonna require as much trenching. So, you know, looking forward 12 months, it, it should be, and it needs to be a major component for any type of infrastructure build out in this country. If I, if I can, Satish, yeah, I just sure, wanna sure. piggyback on something that, that Aaron said. The other opportunity that we see when we think about um, who's gonna own the EV charger and who's gonna own that real estate and charging stations. When you think about the use case that Aaron just talked about, me and a hundred of my closest friends are pulling up to get some juice from the charger. We have high connected vehicles, right? That are, that have data that needs to be offloaded for OEMs, for roadways, for governments, for networks, for taxation, for whatever. And I've got new information that needs to come, whether I'm downloading the latest, you know, like Tiger King or whether or not I'm sending off sensor information to Bridgestone because they want to know how their tires are performing. And so when you think about these hubs, much of it can happen um, just over the network as we think about um, wireless in general, but these hubs and these chargers become data centers, for lack of a better word, where this transmission, not only from electrification is happening, but also massive data transmission. I think what it does is it allows an opportunity to take product companies into service companies, and it extends the opportunity for value chains beyond, um, I just do electric chargers. Now, Aaron is rightly focused in a phenomenal place, but when you start when you start hooking these suckers up to 5G, I, I just think the opportunities there extend pretty considerably. Yeah, yeah. I, th I, think, I think it's. I think it's, it becomes uh, the, the the battery becomes an interesting scalable asset for for power mm -hmm. right? And and so the data hub creates other types of commerce and activity that that data can leverage. And but as well as what do the batteries mean? All these batteries coming to the market in these cars, plugging into Aaron's products through 5G networks. So, so Kristen, maybe I'll turn to you. Like, what what is the utility thinking? How are they taking advantage of that? They're, are they seen as a tailwind or a headwind? Well, I think I think that, I think a lot of utilities are trying to figure out how does this fit in, but it's definitely something that I think can help augment reliability. So as we're talking about, as Elise mentioned, we have all of these other resources, all the truths that she mentioned there, that we know that we're going to have electrification, we know we're going to have more renewables. But what does that mean? Because we know we also know that we're not fully in control of when those renewable plants turn on and off. So how do we understand much better how to um, reliably uh, source in, um, electrons? And that, that needs to be not only stored because electrons have typically not been able to be inventoried. That's really what battery storage is. So this on-demand kind of industry where electrons flow on demand now batteries have the capability of being able to inventory and store mm -hmm. for a later time for many different purposes. Could be economic, could be demand response, could be for um, uh, many, many other types of um, in-grid or off uh, behind the meter types of, of services. So I think that this is something that utility is top of mind for utilities and yeah. especially as um, new, I'll say even real estate development, industrials, commercial, all, all kinds of companies and end users are thinking about how they are going to address these types of reliability issues and how battery storage, communications, et cetera, can be part of that, that portfolio of how to, to do that well. Yeah, and, and, and Aaron, uh, I think it's in, in terms of you know, back to that asset and data, you're building something that creates a portal to that in some ways, and, and actually a lot of ways. And so building off what Kristen just said, like, how do you how do you look at your products as being a benefit or value prop to utilities versus real estate versus urban centers? And and, and on top of that, of course, how connectivity can, is, is going to supercharge that? Yeah, I think on the utility front, what's most interesting to me is that in California, for example, on some days they produce so much electricity via renewables and there's nowhere to store it. And so they actually encourage people to charge their electric vehicle up more than they normally would because it's about offloading power from the grid. Like if you're producing too much energy and you have nowhere to put it, uh, that, I mean, I guess that's kind of a good problem to have, but the more EV chargers that can be installed, the more people that, you know, purchase electric vehicles. Uh, and that's not even considering, you know, vehicle to grid communication, which is still in its infancy. Uh, there's so many said that Tesla still doesn't really 
allow that for consumers. They, it's just like the Nissan Leaf that does it. Um, you know, EV chargers, they're really at the entry point. Like for us, it's about getting these things out there because once you have the, the asset in the ground, everything above the hardware is opportunity space. Whether it's software integrations, whether it's an open API, which is rare in the EV charging or just the energy space in general, uh, it really is just the beginning. Yeah, and it's interesting. I think I think that tells me too a lot of computing and decision making needs, needs to happen. There, there's a there's a attendee that that sent in a question that was top of mind as well. And so maybe I'll, I'll pass. I'll go back to Lisa on this one. Is how do you think about the demand of computing on the edge? If you're talking about all these decisions and, and data processing that's happening right after the charger, let's say, where should where where should we be? Where does it, where do we need to be in terms of edge computing for this to work? Um, yeah, for, and so on. Yeah, I think it really is about. <clears throat> kind of taking advantage of this distributed cloud infrastructure that we have today, but it continuing to extend it. And so um, one of the things that we've deployed along with partners at Amazon and AWS is mobile edge compute. And so thinking about the cloud will be there. Um, it will always be there and it's regionalized, right? Appropriately to look at, you know, maximum uh, or, or optimal kind of response times. But we have an opportunity to actually create compute at the cellular edge, which we call mobile edge compute. And so the partnership between Verizon and AWS Wavelength allows us to deploy high degrees of compute and intelligence right there at the cellular edge. That's how we accomplish um, five milliseconds, you know, up to five milliseconds of latency um, and how we get these hyper decisions to happen in real time. Um, when you think about in the same way that we think about these microgrid infrastructures, which is really what we're talking about today, there's like the big G grid and then there's these microgrids. In the same way, we think about computing in the same way. There's, you know, massive cloud infrastructure and then there's kind of these, uh, these micro or edge compute kind of structures that allow interconnectivity so that you have optimization for decisioning to say, where does this job need to be done and for what purpose? Do I need to have five milliseconds or latency, or can it do 200 milliseconds with a round trip, you know, classic cloud infrastructure provider or not? And so all of that intelligence also in decision-making is being implemented into a software-defined network. I mean, that really is what 5G is. That's how we and other telcos are implementing. And there's just all this intelligence that helps to create all of these micro decisions in milliseconds along the fly to just create the most optimal performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and Brooke, you know, that, that part of that is also understanding, you, you mentioned the kind of more of a bi-directional connection between renewable energy and the grid. You've got edge computing resources coming online, lots of data you can take advantage of coming back to you potentially from, from a distribution grid. How does Orsted take advantage of something like that or use that for your, to your benefit? Uh, you know, I, ignoring the grid and just looking at our, actually, uh, our projects, we have a lot of offshore assets that are several hours uh, boat ride away from, from our technicians and everything. And, and just from a perspective of being able to do, you know, condition surveys of, of our equipment, maybe with a drone, where we can fly over these, this huge, you know, you know, 100 square mile uh, lease area and, and pick up data from individual turbines that they can feed back and sort of guide those people on where, where the focus should be when they do go out there to do operations and maintenance, I think is something we're very interested in. Yeah. And are there, are there and maybe this is for Kristen, are, are there new business models emerging now that now that you have a more of a connection back and forth between supply and demand? And what are, what are some that you've been exploring perhaps with some of your partners and clients? Yeah. There really, there really are. And that's actually what's really fun about seeing what can happen here. Um, when you think about, I keep, I keep trend, uh, juxtaposing what the old model looked like with this new model so we can see how many variations there really are. So when you're thinking about this regulatory, regulated monopoly of one business model and that's where you buy your electrons from and that's, that's all you know about it is the once a month bill that you get um, there's so much more that's happening now that has mm -hmm. created a, um, many different types of not just technologies, use cases, markets, mini markets, if I could use that kind of made up term. And so as you're understanding more and more of the complexities of how you're connecting, grouping together what kinds of technologies, what kinds of operations, how that works, you're actually finding that there are this, these complementary types of business models. SaaS is something that has come to the um, the energy industry that has never had, had never really been considered before. You also have the juxtaposition of um, capital installations, 
or customization of the software and then more and more services that can hang off of that. I think the flexibility of business models that are happening within this industry and so many innovators mm -hmm. that are um, emerging from this, that it's, it's pretty exciting to see what types of um, uh, aggregation you're getting as well as specification for these different types of business models. What I really like about what you're doing, and this is a part of what is important to Build Edison too, is making those connections between who are the innovators, how do their products and services work, but testing them out with some of the bigger players to see in these almost like living laboratories as you're demonstrating projects, what can happen? How do you learn from that? What kinds of shifts do you need to make either to your product or services or how it impacts op real-time operations, real life operations. And um, I'm seeing that there's almost business models happening that are not, that are, that are enabling these types of um, scaled approaches to roll out, which I think is ideal for um, the necessary types of innovation and scaling that we have to do. I, maybe just to build on that, if I can, the thing that hit me uh, when we first started looking at this space is no longer is, do you just have consumers? Mm -hmm. You also, a consumer can also be a generator. And so when you think about this prosumer or this complete dynamic shift, when you think about it from an individual basis, when you think about Airbnb being your energy as a B2B company, like all of a sudden the participation and the opportunity for these new business models, new forms of SLAs, new forms of insurance, yeah. like yeah new forms of bidding infrastructures. I'm yes. like, I, I'm going to get myself all excited just thinking about it, but there's, there's the scroll is long for the ways to explore as Kristen highlighted so well. Yeah. That was, there's, we have a, a client that's uh, that has a lot of operations in Texas and he was describing to us as like, there's nobody to understand. There's no residential consumer in the world that understands what's happening with their, their electric prices more than Texans. And it's That's because right. of those bid models, not just because of what happened just recently, way before yep. that, but I'm saying that it is because of these new technologies, new ways to operate that is creating different types of business models. Markets and bidding opportunities are is, is a whole other world. And so I think we're gonna see more and more of that as well. Totally. Yeah, and with some of the models we've been exploring too is, is around um, opportunities for small business owners, right? So imagine mm -hmm. they're owning four or five trucks that are all EV. <laughs> so first of all, there's an operational challenge. How do you help them charge these things, especially if they live in, let's say, you know, an apartment building? But the second is, where do the, where, is there a new business and incentive for them? These are now, um, you know, important assets, not just a depreciating asset. Um, and so, I don't know, uh, maybe Aaron, like to turn to you, have you, have you been looking at that at all in terms of your products or have you, what have you observed? That could be a good model there. Yeah, it's it's interesting because as you just said, you know, they become long-term energy assets to the grid, not right. just a vehicle that goes from point A to point B. Um, and there's obviously financial implications for small businesses on that front, but they really don't know overall what to do with that. They don't necessarily have. Uh, they're not armed with the information on on how that becomes, you know, better for their business five years out than just a regular depreciating asset. Uh, I, I feel like that's very new and, you know, trucks, electric vehicle trucks are also very new. Uh, the first ones I think are rolling off the line in June. So I'm excited to, to work with small businesses to realize, you know, what, not just what incentives, but what financial models you can create uh, for charging, but also uh, load balancing and fleet management solutions. Um, and the, really the biggest impediment that we're seeing right now is the lack of interoperability among systems. So even if, we throw on an EV charger, it, it's very difficult, even though we have an open API and we're the only network with it, the vehicle manufacturer may not have an open API. So like, how do you get the data from the vehicle to then determine its you know, value two years from now based on the battery capacity? And it's, that, I, that is probably the largest roadblock to small businesses tapping into these assets long-term. It's just the lack of uh, interoperability in data. Yeah, and with, with the EV charging companies in the space, it, it, the ones that will, will I guess, win, is that is that the, the company that figures that out with a vehicle manufacturer or is it the company that takes advantage of the access to the data and connectivity? What, or, is it, or is it the business model? What do you think, Aaron, you know, running a company like this, like what is it, who, what will you fit, need to figure out to basically be the leading EV charging company? I mean, our bet is that openness always wins that walled gardens slow down innovation and, and reduce the runway we have to solve climate change. 
as well as innovation for you know any type of business to grow. Uh, in the marketplace right now, we see a lot of walled gardens. You know, we saw that with financial technology up until mm -hmm. about 10, 12 years ago with, with Plaid and Stripe. And they came onto the scene and said, we believe in openness and we believe this will create you know, not just the next billion dollar company, but the, the next innovation in your pocket. Um, we're betting on that. Yeah, yeah. At least uh, what, have you, what have you seen there, like in terms of what do you think an EV charging company needs to figure out, especially in engaging 5G in the future network? I think Aaron's dead on. I think it really is interoperability. And right now, there isn't, um, there aren't enough players coming together to just decide that they're going to work in that open model with enough big players and innovators together to demonstrate to the rest of the market that this is a workable model. And so we need to quickly work together to kind of uh, showcase the benefit of that reward. But in the same way that we think about the, um, the innovations that happen to public financial markets, to advertising bidding models, to kind of open access and biddable streams, the energy ecosystem is, is just on the verge of kind of that, that tipping point. Um, and we're doing all that we can to kind of push it further faster by providing backbones of technology and, and software kind of inside of those seams. Um, and really, frankly, like the work that we're doing in our upcoming cohort Yep. We're going to do our best to see if we can't solve that interoperability challenge, aren't we, Satish and Aaron? <laughs> We're yes. going to work through that. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's exactly right. And I think uh, the connectivity, interoperability for sure, I think that's that's something that we've seen across the small business aspect of it, whether it's in an urban environment versus, you know, out in the suburbs, um, the different types of cars and vehicles, um, enterprise versus consumer. Like, I think I think that's, that's totally spot on. That interoperability is very key there. Um, so we have Brooke here. I want to turn to a topic on just the focus on renewable energy and, and go on that side a little bit. Brooke, you know, when, you, when we had like a prep call about this, we talked in sort of two ways, right? So the mm -hmm. first was how connectivity is important for you maintaining your infrastructure. So you've got a lot of different sort of assets that you need to kind of manage as these things continuously create energy. And at the same time, um, the transmission side of it as well. And so for you, you know, you mentioned something about how traditionally we would optimize these energy source systems and silos, and now you think there should be more kind of a back and forth between each other and also between the grid. So can you speak more about that and how you think connectivity and 5G will play a role? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that, you know, historically we've had these nice, big, heavy rotating machines and, and when there's system disturbances occur, it, it's not that hard to, uh, you know, adjust what you're doing to, as the system starts falling apart, I guess, as it were. Um, but, you know, now as we, as we introduce these new inverter-based technologies, they can, they can change instantaneously. So a lot of the time, what we're doing when we interconnect is we're, we're modeling how we perform against the system disturbance and then sort of slowing down in our, our control systems, but trying to optimize them so they will behave in a way that's grid code compliant and, and we're not going to you know, knock out the transmission system. And, and we're all doing that. All of us are doing that individually because that's how this whole thing has been set up. We have all these fancy devices, fax devices that we control to keep the grid stable when something happens and, and we are sitting operating and everybody does that. And what we're seeing because all these control systems are, are operating almost instantaneously and there's no communications amongst them. Um, we're seeing that they tend to fight each other. And so we're getting, we're going from, you know, all these super fancy devices that can do incredible things uh, to make the grid more stable. And what we're in effect doing is, is making it less stable. If we continue to do this sort of siloed, everybody solves the problem for themselves. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity to sort of, uh, you know, communicate amongst all of these special devices and, and come up with a more op optimized, you know, real-time solution to the disturbance that occurs. So I, I know there's a lot there, but I mean, I yeah. think it's a great opportunity if we can start looking strategically at how we incorporate these devices to make the grid operate much more efficiently. And we have a great opportunity here. We're putting in a ton of equipment in that's very fancy, can do a lot of things, but we're not maybe optimizing how we use it. Yeah, and I think, and that speaks to load balancing, that speaks to managing from different resource, energy resources based on their stability. Um, and then, you know, what are you charging in the first place? And so, so Kristen, you know, I, I know you've done a lot of work with utilities. How are they, how are they viewing this? Is, 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 is there, you know, is there an excitement? Is it an opportunity? Is it, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. Like, what are you seeing them invest in now? 
Probably a bit of all the above. <laughs> but I can tell you that uh, there's a lot of utilities, especially in the region that I'm in, in the New York region, that are doing a lot of pilot programs. They're working with um, innovators. They're working with big companies. They're trying to understand what kinds of energy efficiency programs and then also new technology programs. So how do we do demonstration and then the demonstration of a new technology? What does that mean? What are the impacts? How does that impact their operations? How do they learn from that? But how do also the solution providers learn from that as well? So the whole concept of scaling from demonstrations is a big, big topic for not only our company, but something that we're working with New York State to develop even further so that we can help not only the, the solution providers, but the utilities, the commercial uh, large uh, energy consumers and producers now understand where we can scale from trying something and then enabling that those lessons to be um, next stepping stones for scaling of next deployments. So as Aaron was saying, you know, you might have a small business that has four trucks and then what does that mean? What do you learn from that? What do they learn from that and how they can grow their business or how that can be leveraged into a larger part of the ecosystem or community. So I think that utilities are really, they're experiencing it, this from, from all angles. They're excited. They're probably nervous about what's happening with their operations because there is so much happening and they need to make sure that they have, they are, I mean, they are held to a very high standard to have a reliable grid. It's not, it's gotta always be there. So just like books, what you were saying about the um, new, if we're doing this all independently, it's just not going to work since there's so much that literally hangs off of these grids. So I think that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's forums yeah. like this, it's, it's, it's um, demonstration projects, learning about them and actually applying that to real world. So, um, you know, I'm sure the, the incubator that's happening, the incubation that's happening at Verizon with new business um, that Elise does is, is testing out a lot of that. Yeah, I think it's I think I think it's I think it's probably all of the above. We speak in utilities yeah. as well. But we spoke with Con Ed and DT in Michigan and on various microgrids as well. And and there there there's a groups that look at what Aaron and his his business and his side of the business is doing EV charging. There are groups that are integrating with with Orsted and their side and from the renewable energy side. I'm um, coming back to you, Elise. You know, from from NBI's perspective, what should a utility think about in terms of engaging 5G connectivity or maybe even Verizon themselves in terms of your work in the utility space? Yeah, I think it's a, um, I, I think about it in two ways. One is uh, really for that interoperability, like you need a sustainable and reliable backbone that provides ultra low latency and the data highway to get all this stuff done. Um, but when we think about our engagements with utilities, it's about how can we help connect you to the rest of this ecosystem and how can we bring to bear our corporate innovation and our innovation partners so that we come with an end-to-end -end solution and one of the things that I'll, I'll pick up off um, from, from what Christian was talking about is we're at this point where we have, I think, enough early stage innovators to put together a complete end-to-end -end solution. We've got a lot of players in the space and the VC market is flooded with capital. However, I think part of the challenge that we have, particularly as we look to scale, is ensuring, and I think there might be actually a question in the Q&A about it, but ensuring that we race to ROIC as quickly as possible and ROI. Right now, some of these capital deployments are extremely expensive and likely cannot happen without a larger company kind of funding some of those initial deployments, which means that they're not gonna wait 10 to 15 years for that ROI to kind of come. They need more immediate response on that ROI so that they can see that payoff and continue to deploy. I believe the only way we're gonna get there is that mix of big company, medium company, and small company coming together. So you have enough capital flowing you have enough runway for risk. You have enough time in order to like get a few things wrong. It's probably not going to work best the first <laughs> time. And you can flex and bend some of those financial models to deliver a low TCO or total cost of ownership. Otherwise, we're just going to sit here until the battery market comes down, the supply you know, is more readily available, and we can look at those cost structures. Um, I think that also has to happen above and beyond kind of that interoperability. Um, and I think that that's where the combination of these different entities coming together can also help. Yeah, and this is a, and this is a question interoperability too. Like this is a question, all, a lot of that capital, there's there's a lot of private capital going into the microgrid section of, of the industry as well. And, and I think we're all seeing that there will be a convergence of microgrid with, with traditional utilities. 
And so what do you, maybe Lisa, Kristen, or to all of you, like, what do you think about the challenges there, the interoperability challenge, the advantages of connectivity that allows microgrids to link better with utilities and link better with products like Aaron and folks like me with car or truck. Yeah. So maybe you can speak a bit about that. Like, how is it an advantage? What is that? What is the challenge there? Um, maybe at least want to keep going. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll just uh, maybe I'll do one point here, but I actually think that Kristen might be better equipped to answer the question more fully. But one of the one of the more exciting things is new legislation that's coming out that creates requirement for distributed energy resources to attach back and to participate in these ecosystems. We're not all the way there. We got a lot of work to do, and I am not a regulatory expert on energy. But some of those advancements that we're seeing um, in Washington, D.C. are uh, kind of an awakening. Um, I, I think they're a bit late. And so what I also love seeing is corporate innovation and corporate sustainability efforts that are also driving it. None of these corporations are going to be able to meet their sustainability goals without fundamental change in this ecosystem. And so whether you like it or not or are participating or are a bystander, it's happening because all of these things kind of those truths are kind of coming to be. Um, and so corporations are going to throw money into it. Regulation has to be there to support it. Um, and so I see kind of some of these things starting to converge. It's taken just about forever, but I feel like we're really close. Right. But Kristen can probably, or, or the others can probably speak to it a little bit more intelligently in terms of some of those other moving parts and pieces. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll talk about yep. it's almost a joke when I used to ask like a question, how many, how would you define a microgrid? If you asked, you know, 10 people, you might get 15 different answers. So what I like the um but what's what's happening today at least is actually right on target. Not only is there legislation, but even before that, I, we, we see that legislation and regulation always seems to lag what's happening in technologies. So as you have the combination of innovators and large corporates working together to um, strategically innovate and then in, iterate, I think is maybe a word that we're, we're looking that I've been looking for to talk about this concept. You're starting to see like, why, why have a microgrid in the first place? How does that help or hurt the utility grid? And so it, 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 it can, it's something that needs to, that has developed almost on its own. And you have these individual microgrids, but the more you have them, you still have this connectivity to grid in many, many cases. Take mm -hmm. for example, community solar and what that's done. Those are effectively little mini microgrids, depending upon how you want to define the term microgrid. And what has to happen there is many different types of aspects of what is the asset, how is it capitalized, how is it utilized, how is it managed, how is it, um, what is pricing, um, so that, and then how, of course, uh, does it integrate back into grid resources because it's probably not the only resource for that that solar community to um, to use. Mm -hmm. So these are a lot of pressing issues that we're making a lot of headway with. But I, I, I keep going back to this concept of let's pilot, let's demonstrate, let's mm -hmm. learn, and then, and then continue to iterate on the innovation so that you can com, com, make, make the progress that's necessary. Yeah, that's great. So I like to, I like to end these with like sometimes asking, maybe when I get to each of the panels, so we'll see who wants to go first, but then we'll call on somebody is, you know, what is a crazy kind of amazing technology or early stage venture? And it can't be EV Passport because they're on the panel. But what's out there that's saying, well, if that works the way that there's, they think it can, that will change the way we think about energy, charging, renewable energy, whatever it may be. Um, just what, what are you seeing in the world that's exciting to you? You don't have to name what it is, but what's the type of tech um, that's exciting to you? Let's go first. I'll, I'll, I'll go with top okay, of, go what happened top of mind, like from the yeah. hip here. I've said for about two decades that storage in its many, many forms can transform the industry going from something that is an instantaneous type of on-demand resource to something that has an inventoryable, uh, I make up words as I go, <laughs> inventory that can be inventory and stored to be used at later times. This is something that needs to be scaled. It needs to be something that's not just in our phones. It's not just um, at big, big types of storage uh, facilities, but also at many different types of points along the way. And I think that that's something that uh, I'm looking forward to, but that has so much that comes with it. What are the communications? How is it used? How do you measure this? So um, uh, along with a lot of other types of building infrastructure, storage at many different scales um, is something that I think is of, of interest. 
Yeah. Brooke, what do you think? Yeah. Yeah, I, I wouldn't call it necessarily a technology, but I, I think the whole concept of flipping the the switch uh, on on how we operate our grid by going, uh, you know, matching generation to load. Uh, from to matching load to the generation is going to be a huge game changer. And I'm really excited to see how we implement that and make that happen because it, it will change a lot of how our grid operates and uh, how we think about electricity. Yeah. And Aaron, how about you? Like in terms of your peers, the found, other founders in the world, what are you, what are you seeing? What's one thing you're seeing? Exciting. So for, for me, it's similar. It's not like some magical new technology. Um, as much as I would love like wireless power. Um, <laughs> it's, it's really about simplification of the grid overall from end to end. You know, right now you have a very complicated system with peaker plants that, you know, tend to be, uh, you know, coal powered or, or natural gas. And so anything we can do to simplify the grid is what I view as, you know, beyond just good for the planet being renewables, but kind of a beautiful moment when you have solar on everyone's roofs and, and vehicles that communicate and, and all of this stuff, it just becomes a lot simpler. It becomes like going from, from a horse to a, to a car and now you're going to electric cars. Like it's just natural evolution. And when we get to a point where it's the dominant thing, we're gonna have so many assets that are just kind of sitting there. And it's like, what do you do with those assets now? Like these old power plants, what do you do with them? Um, so for me, it's about, and I'm a minimalist, so really it's about taking minimalism and simplification to society as a whole. I like that. And Elise, uh, you obviously you're seeing a lot of startups come through New Lab, and of course with other yeah. energy activities, you're constantly exploring and developing your own technologies. What's exciting? What's one thing that's exciting? I can't pick one. I'm going to tell you okay. what <laughs> excites me as a mother of three very rambunctious children and what excites me as a, um, a person with a big girl job. So as a mom, um, I get really excited about these kinetic energy um, components where my kids can kick soccer balls and throw footballs and swim in the pool. And all of those produce energy that can be renewable and plugged back into my house. I think that is epic. Like that's just super exciting. Um, because then I think about gamification of like, you know, play and things like that. Um, as a, as an executive, I think really, um, it's not super sexy, but it's not available today and it's real time optimization and actually using 5g and mobile edge compute to actually make it real time and thinking about this data flow in a living, breathing, hyper dynamic infrastructure that we can all live on. That's highly sustainable. I don't know if there's anything better than that, maybe except the soccer ball, but that's pretty, mm -hmm. that's pretty sexy. Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> that's great. So, so that's, that's the hour it went really fast. Um, I want to thank <clears throat> all the attendees that joined us today and, and definitely our panelists. I think you guys are all doing amazing things to make the world better. And, and these are all necessary for our infrastructure and for to make the world work in a more sustainable way. So I appreciate everything you do in your jobs and in and, and, and the industries you work in. So thank you for participating in the panel. Thanks for having me. Bye right. everyone. Thank you.